Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Christ Presbyterian Church and to this hour of worship. Um, just a few announcements uh, before we, we begin. Um, next Sunday, uh, we will have a congregational meeting uh, for the election of deacons and ruling elders. And that meeting will be right after the worship service. It should only take about uh, 10 minutes. And we will be uh, electing deacons and elders uh, to begin their terms in uh, 2023. This Wednesday night, I'm, I'm going to restart our Zoom Bible study, and we're going to be uh, looking at the Gospel of Luke, and uh, I have tossed out the old list. So uh, if you want to participate in the Zoom Bible study, 7 p.m. Wednesday night, you need to sign up um, again and uh, give me your email address, and it goes from 7 p.m. to 7.30. On October 15, uh, CPW, uh, Christ Presbyterian Women, are having a luncheon at the Ministry Center, and the details are uh, here in the uh, bulletin, and there's a sign-up um, over here on the information table. And now, uh, let's worship God. Would you please draw your attention to the screen for this morning's call to worship? Please stand. <laughs> know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us. We are we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Our great shepherd God, we come to you this morning seeking your care and your nourishment, desiring to meet you in both glorious places of joy and also deep places of fear and sadness, knowing that you are an ever-present shepherd. We ask that you would fill our hearts with gratitude for your care and your guidance as we open our hearts to you in worship this morning. Prepare us to receive your word. Give us minds to understand and hearts to respond. And give us, too, an anticipation for your presence with us this morning as we anticipate being in your presence forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
You may be seated. Would you please draw your attention to our prayer of confession located in your bulletin. Please pray with me. Loving Father, you have created us to worship you alone. You have dealt kindly and patiently with us, and we should worship you with joy and gratitude every day. Your word should delight us, and your law call us to obedience. Yet, Lord, we are great sinners who run from you often. We exchange your truth for lies because we don't want to obey you. We want to be our own gods, and we turn from you towards the idols that enchant us. We desire sinful things and sell our souls to get them. Father, forgive us and have mercy upon us. We thank you for Jesus who worshiped you alone, paid the price for our sin, and restores us to fellowship with you and one another. Please confess your sins silently before the Lord. Friends in Christ, know that your sins are forgiven. And God declares that to you today through Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 2. Hear the word of the Lord and his assurance of pardon to you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Thanks be to God.
You may be seated. This morning, during the pastoral prayer, I will be praying back through Psalm 100. Um, so if you want to open up your Bible to Psalm 100 or your phone and follow along with me uh, as I pray us through the text, um, you are more than welcome. But let us go before God's throne of mercy. O oh Lord, as we come into your presence today to worship you in spirit and in truth, as a gathered church and congregation, we have sung our joyful noises to you in all the earth. We serve you, O oh Lord, with gladness in our hearts, and we sing our praises to you. Lord, we know that you are the Lord of all, that you are indeed God. You have made us, and we are the people of your pasture. Help us, O Lord, to keep in mind your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our good shepherd. Help us, help us in times of need when we wander off the beaten paths, and you hunt us down and bring us back into your presence. May we delight in your goodness and your providential care for us as your flock. Lord, this week, as we worship you in private, as a family, or as a congregation, may we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. Regardless of what has happened to us, either that day or throughout the week, may we be a congregation that rejoices in the midst of our suffering and in the midst of times where everything goes to be, seems to be going perfectly well. Regardless of our situation, O oh Lord, we are instructed by your word to give you thanks and we indeed bless you. O oh Lord, you are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. May we be a congregation here at Christ Presbyterian who rejoices in your faithfulness, not only to us as individuals, but all the generations in the midst of the, our little flock. May we indeed that, know that you are providentially caring for us. O oh Lord, as we think about our own particular congregation, we pray for those who are in need of healing. We pray for Dan and Barb, Bob, Dave, Casey, Ron, Ruthie, Charles, Jim, Josh, and Diana, and Jim and Laura as well. Lord, may they trust in you, whatever their, whatever you, wherever the fire has them at this time, and may your providential hand be leading them through that. May they trust in your goodness and know that you are watching over them as the good shepherd. We also pray for those affected by the hurricane in Florida um, that, that affected several EPC churches, but we just don't pray for our own denomination. We pray for all Christians in Florida and throughout our country have been affected by the hurricane. And we also lift up those who do not know you yet, Lord, that you're common grace would cover them and that your mercy would be upon them. We pray for our presbytery, and this week we pray for the Community Presbyterian Church of Onalaska and their pastor, Zach Nearson. We pray that they would be a congregation that preaches your gospel in its purity, administers the sacraments in their integrity, and continues to gather as a congregation to lift up their prayers before you. May they experience revitalization, and may they truly uh, be a beacon of hope and light in a dark world. May you use them, O oh Lord, that, that little congregation, um, and may they be a blessing to their community. Finally, we pray the words that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord by giving him our tithes and offerings.
Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, may you take these tithes and offerings which we have given back to you in response to your grace and mercy, and may, the, may you use them to advance your kingdom here in the Treasure Valley, throughout our region, and throughout the entire world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. morning. My name is Melanie Gorsica, and I invite you to take your Bibles that you brought with you today and turn to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. We're going to uh, read from chapter 44, verses 6 through 9. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we praise you for your faithfulness. You are the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. You alone are holy, and you alone are our God and our Savior. Be with us now and bless the reading and hearing of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear the word of God. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what it is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. All who fashion idols are nothing. 
and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand to sing. seated. We are uh, con continuing today our journey, journey through the book, book of Romans. And uh, today we come to Romans 1 and verses 18 to 25. Um, <clears throat> just uh, before before I read the text, I want to say a word uh, about uh, Romans chapter 1 and uh, what it has meant in my life. Um, when I was um, a student, uh, a college student, and uh, like a lot of uh, college students, I was hearing things, uh, I was hearing direct attacks on Christianity. And I was uh, beginning uh, to doubt the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word. Uh, because I, I had never been exposed to that before. And by the way, um, the church ought to expose young people to questions that they will hear in college. They shouldn't be surprised. That's a different sermon. But anyway, I, I will always uh, thank God uh, for the book of Romans and also for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Um, I attended the second year of college. I attended a week-long conference where we did an in intensive study of the Book of Romans. Eight hours a day, just diving into the Book of Romans. And chapter one I came to the conclusion is the most accurate description of what's gone wrong with the human race. Everybody knows that something has gone wrong with the human race. Romans 1 is the most tr truthful, the most accurate description of what has gone wrong wrong. Uh, well, uh, Genesis 3 also. But um, many commentators 
uh, believe that Romans chapter 1 is Paul's uh, commentary on Genesis 3 and the story of Adam and Eve and the fall. Um, so, Romans 1, verses 18 uh, through 25, hear the word of God. For the wrath of God is re revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God purpose God purposefully designed creation to point to himself. Now, if you can, um, this is only one time, by the way. I've, I've, I've told you before um, that I can see the beauty out the back, but you can't, and that's good because you would be entranced um, but if, if you can, turn around and look out the window. Do you see evidence of God? Every blade of grass, every leaf of every tree, the stars of the night sky, the sunrise, the sunset, is all evidence of the handiwork of God. And God intentionally designed his creation with captivating beauty so that we would not only see his handiwork, we would see him and we would be drawn to him. Psalm 19 says the heavens declare, the heavens declare, it's talking about the night sky. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims the firmament, once again, the night sky. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, 
whose voice is not heard. Yet, Psalm 19 goes on, yet their voice, the voice of creation, goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. I've, I've been in conversation uh, with many atheists over the course of my life. And they'll always ask the same question. If God is real, why doesn't he show himself? And I'm too polite. But I want to say, open your eyes. Every blade of grass, every tree, every star in the night sky, the sunrise, the sunset, it all proclaims the God who made everything. Just open your eyes. There are two books in which God reveals himself. This book and the book of nature. God reveals himself in nature, in his creation. Paul says in Romans 1, 19 and 20, I'm going to read it to you again. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived since the creation of the world. Divine nature. There is a God who made everything that we see. And his eternal... <clears throat> you can just look at nature and know that there has to be a God who made this. And he is all-powerful. His eternal power and divine nature, says Paul, have been obvious, clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that has been in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Creation reveals God. Now, at some deep level, everyone knows this. Everyone. Even the atheist. Even the skeptic. At some deep level knows this. But Paul says in verse 18 that human beings deliberately suppress the truth of God. We deliberately do it. And by the way, uh, Christians do it all the time too. Uh, when, we, when we forget God. We suppress the truth that we know. We know it, but we suppress it. It's not that we don't know that God exists. Even the atheists, they know, but by their unrighteousness, says Paul, they suppress the truth. So here's what happens. What happens is the creation that was designed to point us to God replaces God in our hearts. The creation, the created things that were designed to point us to God replace God in our hearts. That's called idolatry. 
and idolatry is the sin that comes before every other sin. The Apostle Paul, once again, Romans 125. They, the human race, exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Sin is fundamentally idolatrous because the nature of sin is that we love something that God made more than we love God. The opening pages of the Bible tell us that God created the first humans, Adam and Eve, and placed them in a beautiful garden. Every every plant in that garden, every animal in that garden, beautiful animal, pointed to God. And God told them to enjoy the fruit of any tree in the garden except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Now let's consider how the sin Consider how the sin of Adam and Eve is described. And um, the, the longer I s- study this, the more I'm convinced that Romans 1 is Paul's commentary on Genesis 3. Uh, the Hebrew term is uh, midrash. It's Paul's midrash on Genesis 3. Listen to Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, and he ate. Adam and Eve knew that the tree was off limits, but there was, a, there was a tempter in the garden who told them a lie. He said, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so Eve, I picture Eve gazing at that fruit. And Adam was there too. Um, And I picture him just gazing at that fruit and the beauty of that fruit. The text says they saw that it was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and it would make them wise, knowing good and evil. And you know what happened? That fruit that God created replaced God in their hearts. They made an idol of that tree. They looked to the tree. They looked to that fruit to give them life and meaning and hope. They made an idol of that tree. They worshiped it. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Idolatry is the sin that comes before every other sin We worship something that God has made instead of the God who made it. You can search for life and meaning. You can search for life and meaning and hope only in two directions. 
either vertically or horizontally, right? You can search for life and meaning and hope either vertically in God or horizontally in creation and in other people. Either you have found life to the fullest vertically or you are shopping for it horizontally. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans 1. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. And the lie is the false promise that heart-satisfying life can be found anywhere other than our creator. It's the cruelest lie ever told. And if you believe it, it will not only leave you empty and discouraged, but it will set your life on a course of destruction. It was um, Blaise Pascal, the 17th century French mathematician, who said there is a God-shaped vacuum in every heart which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the Creator. Nothing in the physical world can give you life, can give you the life that your heart longs for. God alone is able to bring the deepest joy and contentment to your heart. God alone is able to give you a reason for getting up in the morning, a reason for living. We are broken sinners and prone to surrender our hearts to something other than God. Uh, John Calvin said, the human heart is a factory of idols. You and I were created for worship, and we will worship something. Even the atheists worship something. Whatever commands the love of your heart and sets the direction of your life, that's what you worship. You were created to worship. We don't just worship in formal religious uh, settings like this. You are a worshiper. I am a worshiper every every moment of every day. You and I are always looking for something to which we can attach our identity, our hopes, our dreams, our inner peace, And whatever controls the worship of your heart controls your choices, your words, your emotions, your actions. Um, Let me give you an illustration. I've heard, well, I've just heard a, a rumor that people who live in the same house will sometimes snap at each other. (laughs) Yes. Charlie, you're getting me in trouble. (laughs) We're human, but that's no excuse to be unloving. Uh, Last week, I was irritated by something 
and I snapped at Sharla. And she just walked, walked away quietly. And I was filled with grief. I had done it again. I had been the husband that I don't want to be. Now, why did this happen? It's humbling to admit, but my problem was not a relationship problem. It wasn't simply a misunderstanding. No, I did what I did, and I said what I said because I have a worship problem. And I'm going to say you do too. The whole human race has a worship problem. All of our hearts worship something, and there are only two options. We will worship God or something he created. It is only when God is in the rightful place of rule in our hearts that people are in the, in the appropriate place in our lives. You and I can keep the second greatest commandment only when we keep the greatest commandment. You know what the second greatest commandment is? Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And you and I can keep that commandment only when we keep the great commandment. Jesus said, the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all of your heart and mind and strength. If God is in his rightful place, if, let me correct that. If God is not in his rightful place, guess who we insert in his place? When I snapped at Sharla, I was bowing in worship to me. I worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. I am in desperate need of a savior. And so are you. We've exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And because we worship things other than God, we fail to keep God's righteous law. And so, Jesus, the Son of God, came into the world to defeat sin and to cleanse away sin out of our lives. The sin that causes us to worship everything but God. The purpose of the cross of Christ was not only to forgive our sin, to wash away our sin, but to re- Claim us. The purpose of the cross is to reclaim us for the one thing every human being was created to do to worship and serve our Maker. The grace to worship, what we were meant to worship, is the grace that we all need. You see, we exchange the truth of God for a lie. And God in his love 
and mercy did an even greater exchange. He exchanged his son for us. Jesus took our place on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake God made him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's the bottom line. Sin kidnapped our worship. And the grace of God through his son, Jesus, restores us to our rightful owner and restores our worship to its rightful owner, God. It is only when God is in his rightful place in our hearts that everything else is in the appropriate place in our lives. And only the grace of God can accomplish this. Let's pray together. Father, we confess before you that we, along with the entire human race, beginning with Adam and Eve, we've exchanged the truth about you for a lie and worshipped and served the creature, worshipped and served ourselves rather than you. And we thank you. We thank you so much for Jesus who came among us fully human, fully God, to redeem and restore, to bear the penalty for our sin. But not just to forgive us, but to restore us to right relationship with you. Help us by your Holy Spirit to worship you every day, not just on Sunday morning, but in our daily walk to bow before you, to seek you and honor you with our lives. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand and join me in the affirmation of faith that is printed in your bulletin. Uh, and uh, as is our tradition on communion, commun communion Sunday, we're doing uh, question one of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him.
come to the Lord's table today. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm still recovering from presbytery. It was a long week. <laughs> My mind's not working too well. Mine isn't either. <laughs> um, did everybody get one of these little chalices? Anybody else need one? Well, it's my turn to preach now. Phil got to preach earlier, so I get, to, I get the sermonette before we uh, encounter the Lord through his table and his grace and mercy. But uh, yesterday, we had the wonderful pleasure of flying back from Seattle. Um, and something that I reflected on a lot in our pastor's retreat in Presbytery was the providence of God. And you can really see that on display in the Heidelberg Catechism. It's a lot about grace, but also God's providence, that he is in control and directing our footsteps. And on both flights, we actually got to see God's beautiful creation. So as we went to Seattle, um, Phil got the window seat then, and I was listening to a podcast and not really paying attention. And he said, look, uh, there's uh, Mount Hood, Mount St. Helens, and Mount Rainier. And they were absolutely beautiful. You got to see them all, their beauty and splendor. Um, I had the great pleasure of getting the window seat on the way back, and uh, Phil was reading something on his phone, I think, and I got to tap him on his shoulder and said, look, we're flying over Mount Rainier. Um, now, who's seen Mount Rainier in person or flown over top of it? You can raise your hand. Okay, pretty much everybody. I got to show Sarah the pictures she hasn't got to yet and her folks. Um, but it was absolutely breathtaking and gorgeous to see creation in all its beauty and splendor. Um, and also throughout the week, um, we prayed at Presbytery through Psalm 24, and it's about the mountain. Um, and mountains in scripture signify God's providence and his care for us. And as we were in Presbytery this week, Mount Rainier kind of followed us all over the place. Um, even in the cabin, or it was, we were on the ocean. You can, I'll post pictures on our Facebook feed, so go back and look. But you could see Rainier in the distance. And what I think the Lord was telling me through that experience is, my presence is with you always. Now, as we come to the Lord's table, let's kind of keep that mountain in our imagination and think about God's grace and mercy. Think about how big that mountain is and how small you feel whenever you saw it or you were next to it. And think that God still cares for you and he cares for you enough to condescend from his holy hill as we see in scripture and that he comes down to us in his grace and mercy through the cross. Um, the real interesting thing is mountains are big and beautiful and lovely. But as Psalm 8 tells us, uh, the crown jewel of creation is actually human beings. Um, imagine how much of a difference the world would be if we created every single human, or treated every human being like that, that we encountered every day. I know I fail really shortly of seeing that every day. But just keep that in your imagination, that God in his grace and mercy cared enough for us to condescend from his high holy mountain and to rescue, to save, and redeem us. Mm. And by his grace, we are saved. Mm. Now, as we come to the Lord's table today, uh, this is not my table, it is the Lord's table. And I invite all to come forward this morning uh, who trust in the good news of the gospel for the eternal salvation and who have been baptized as well. If you do this morning, know that this table is for you uh, and that God's grace and mercy uh, extends out to you. Let's pray, to, pray together. Heavenly Father, we lift our hearts in thanks and praise to you, for you alone are holy. You alone worthy of all glory and honor and blessing and praise. Holy God, when we rebelled, rebelled against you, right from the beginning. You never gave up on us. You searched for Adam and Eve, saying, where are you? You called to yourself a people, Israel, and you revealed to them your holy law 
and you made covenant with them that you would be their God and they would be your people. And no matter how Israel strayed, you were always faithful and sent the prophets to call them back to yourself. And when the time was just right, you fulfilled the promise of those prophets when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into the world out of love for the world to give his life on the cross for us that we might be restored to relationship with you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sinless life. We thank you for his obedience to you that he took up the cross and went there freely, voluntarily, in our place so that we might be forgiven and made new. And we thank you that death could not hold him. But he was raised, as your word says, by the power of an indestructible life. And he ascended into heaven. And you have exalted him at your right hand. <clears throat> given him the name which is, is above every name. And one day he will return to judge the world in righteousness and to reign forever. Until that day comes, we thank you, Father, for this holy meal. And we pray now that you would pour out your spirit on these simple gifts of the bread and the cup, that by them we would be nourished with the life of Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. On the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke the bread and said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. At this time, as a congregation, I would ask that you take your uh, element, peel back the seal, and as you are prompted by the Spirit to feast upon the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way, Jesus took the cup <clears throat> after they had eaten supper. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. And the apostle Paul tells us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And now if you'll peel off the lid on the cup portion and remember that Jesus said I am, the, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you abide in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord. We thank you for your grace in the sacrament of communion. 
We thank you, O Lord, as frail uh, creatures who look upon the beauty of creation at the stars of the heaven, beautiful mountains that you have placed in this world, such as Mount Rainier, that you have not left us alone. Indeed, O Lord, you have condescended to us uh, and you call us as sinners uh, saved by your grace. Lord, help us as a congregation throughout this week to know that you are truly present um, with us, that by your Spirit who unites us to your Son, uh, you are present with us all the time. Help us, O oh Lord, this week to remember your sacrament and to know that you are providentially caring for us as the Good Shepherd. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing. give you a, a benediction I want to give you a charge remember that you go nowhere by accident but everywhere by divine appointment with every person that you meet in the days ahead God that meeting was arranged by God with every person that you meet, God has some gift of his love that he would share through you. It may be a smile and a listening ear. Uh, it may be a word of encouragement and hope. It may even be the opportunity to share what God has done in your life and to share the gospel. So go in God's peace and love and power. And so now receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore. Amen.
Church, where are you going? Glory to God. Amen.